Hey Thrivers, you're listening to season two, episode number 18. Today, Christine and I are sitting down to chat with none other than Marie Munville. Marie was the wife of the Amish schoolhouse shooter back in 2006. And today she is here sharing with us her story. She is just such an amazing woman who has endured heartache and loss and come through to the other side even stronger and more empowered than before. She is just an inspiration we are blessed to have with us today. Welcome to The Thrive, a podcast for working moms. This is for all the women and moms listening. If you work from home, in an office, run your own business, or are the CEO of your family, this podcast is for you. Because at the end of the day, all moms are working moms. Rachel and Christine invite you to celebrate the victories, get advice, listen to their mom fails, and to know you aren't alone, to thrive in your everyday life. This is Rachel and Christine. We are so excited to have with us a guest today who is local to the area, but also um, a speaker who travels across the country doing speaking and presentations for all types of events. We have with us today Marie Munville. So welcome, Marie. Thanks so much. Thank you for joining us. We're so honored to have you. Oh, it's so fun to hang out with you and your babies this <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> yes, yes. Disc cleaner. This is another episode with the babes. Yes, Robbie and Dorothy are here and they've promised to be quiet and let their moms ask very good questions. So we should be good. <laughs> <laughs> So yes, if you if you hear someone burping or just you know making some noises, it's the newborns. It's not us. We promise. But we know that we are in good company with moms mm-hmm. of children of all ages who yes. know know the deal. So yes. you guys understand how it is. So today we're gonna to be talking to Marie a little bit about her experiences, um, what it's like um, being a mom and mm-hmm. a businesswoman and. An author. I'm actually about a third of the way through her book, um, which is just amazing. And it's a tearjerker. It has had me already. Um, <laughs> so maybe I need to hold off on reading it. Because <laughs> I've cried a lot recently. I know it's some postpartum, but maybe we'll wait a month before I dive into that. <laughs> so Marie, tell us a little bit about yourself. Introduce yourself to our sure. listeners. So outside of being an author and speaker, I am primarily a wife and mom. We have a blended family with six children. One of them is not at home. So we have five kids at home ranging in age from 13 to 20. Our youngest we adopted, and I'm sure that I'll get to that part of our fun story later on. But um, primarily, I love being a mom. That's what I always wanted to be when I was a girl growing up. And so uh, while I do other things, that's certainly a very important component of my life. And I'm just so excited to talk about all things mom, <laughs> business, life today. Yeah. Awesome. So as I was reading your book, you actually started fairly young. I you did. You married your high school sweetheart, correct? I did. So when I was, you know, 18, graduating from high school, getting ready to get married, I thought this is amazing, wonderful. And now being a mom with kids that age, I was, I'm thinking, what on earth <laughs> what was I doing? doing? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Because I look at them and I think, there is no way that I would allow them to get married at this age. <laughs> How do you think your yeah. parents felt at the time, though? Was it just more common, like, I think you know, so. 15, 20 years ago? Like- yeah, and I think that's, I mean, I had talked about wanting to be a wife and a mom since I was a little girl. Those were my two great yeah. life goals. Mm-hmm. So I think they were used to hearing me talk about that. Oh. Uh, they, you know, had certainly gotten to know my first husband. We had met at church and, you know, we knew yeah. each other's family and mm-hmm. had spent a lot of time together before we got married. So I think they just kind of thought, yeah, yeah that's probably you. Marie's next step. Yeah. yeah. And they trusted your yeah. judgment and are yes. like, okay, she's ready. Yeah. <laughs> that's so yes. funny. I feel like I always joke with my daughter, like, when she says things like, you know, we're best friends or whatever, it like melts my heart. And I'm always like, hey, you're going to be my best friend, right? Until yes. you're like 30. Forever. Like remember, yeah. this, like, remember this when you're like a teenager. Yeah. But I always tease it like, and you can't move out until you're at least 30. Yeah. And yes. she'll be like, okay. She has yes. no concept. But like, really, I'm like, don't move out. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I enjoy having my kids at home still and. Mm-hmm. You know, it's fun to see them move into different stages of life, but it, it is special to have them at home and, and yeah. have time with them. That's yeah. awesome. 
So tell us a little bit about how you became a blended family. Tell us. Yeah. Start at the beginning. Start at the beginning. So where are you yes. like that start? <laughs> yes. Well, I always tell everyone, you know, obviously the main point of life transition for me was on October 2nd, 2006, when my first husband took the Amish schoolhouse hostage. But really, in order to tell you the whole story, I have to go back further than that, because so much of what has happened in my life hasn't just been about the tragic events of that day, mm-hmm. but have really been about... You know, some tragic events that happened before that. So let me back you up a little bit and then we'll kind of move through my story. So, you know, like I said, when I was going through high school, I just wanted to get married. I wanted to have a family and certainly marrying my high school sweetheart. It was kind of like, yep, check mark number one off the list. I'm very mm-hmm. goal oriented. So I thought, you know, I'm, I'm doing what I want to do, what my life is supposed to look like. We found out in our first year of marriage that we were expecting a child and I thought, Check mark number two, I'm going to be a mom. What could be better than this? But I started to experience complications to the pregnancy around 20 weeks. They really had no idea why and just put me on bed rest, but it wasn't the answer. I went into premature labor on uh, November 14th, and our daughter was born at 26 weeks. She only lived for 20 minutes before she passed away. And so for me, in that season of life, I was thinking, okay, God, why have you allowed this? Why are you allowing me to walk through such a heartbreaking situation? And while it doesn't feel that long ago, you know, almost 20 years ago, I don't think people talked as much about pregnancy loss. Mm -hmm. Certainly there wasn't Facebook and social media Mm -hmm. and all of these platforms where you really can connect with other parents, other women who have had similar experiences, and it felt quite isolating. Um, So for me, it was a very difficult season of trying to figure out now who am I and what am I supposed to do with this? You know, I remember laying in the hospital that very first night listening to cries of newborns down the hallway and thinking, I can't believe that this is my reality. I never imagined going home from the hospital without my daughter. Mm-hmm. Um, so for me, so that, even like heading in, you probably assumed like this is way I, too early, but yeah, like it'll be okay. okay. Right. And since it was my first pregnancy, I didn't really know that I was in labor and it wasn't like a typical contraction pattern. It was just pretty much one excruciating pain that didn't stop. So I didn't know, oh, this is, you know, you're moving through the second stage of labor. I didn't get that Um, at 26 weeks, you know, not having had childbirth class or anything, you know, like I wasn't really supposed to be that far. And it's also probably different when you're that early along, it probably does not feel quite the same. Yeah. So at first, you know, when I got to the hospital, they were like, oh, just relax. It's fine. And then they started to realize things were moving much more quickly than they had anticipated. And there was just no stopping it. Yeah. Yeah. So so sorry about that. Thanks. Yeah. And, you know, I know that a lot of women who are probably listening have had similar experiences, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and sometimes it's not shared or maybe not, it's a difficult thing to share. Um, we all go through pain. We all experience brokenness. And for me, that was probably the first and greatest pain that I ever knew. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it was a true point. You said how it was probably shared less. I think now people might be a little bit more accustomed to sharing ups and downs just because of social media and the way things have changed. But I'm sure that felt so different and probably isolating to Mm -hmm. not know many women. And also because you were married younger, did you have a lot of married friends at the time or were you sort of like the first of your friends to be married and to be having kids? I was the first of my friend group. There were other people in our extended family, other Mm -hmm. couples who were expecting. I had a friend across the street where I lived. She was also pregnant and due about a month before me. So it Mm -hmm. kind of felt like Everywhere I looked, there was somebody that was pregnant and I wasn't pregnant anymore. Um, So it really was a difficult season of trying to figure out who am I now and what is life supposed to look like. And I think for me, you know, I was raised in the church and I had accepted Christ as my savior at a very young age. But for me, it was this realization of, okay, God, I don't really trust you because I want to be in control of my life. I want to know that everything I want is going to happen. Mm -hmm. I want the guarantee of having a child. And there just aren't any guarantees like that. So I would say it also led to kind of like a crisis of faith for me, mm-hmm. of trying to figure out how to get everything that I knew in my head to be someplace in my heart that I could really say authentically, okay, I I will let this go. Um, I just wanted yeah. to be in control. And I think giving that up for me seemed like such a great risk. Okay. Yeah. yeah. 
Wow. For sure, especially then, if, like you said, you like to have control of things. Yes. Are you, I can are you like the that. type A? Like, yes, I'm very type A. <laughs> my mom always used to say that I had my ducks in a row, height-wise, alphabetized, and color-coded. Oh, <laughs> oh my goodness. Yes. I'm better now, but, yeah. um, you know, so for me, it was just this working out of, okay, so how do I let go of the things that I've held on to for so long? Mm -hmm. um, of being gracious with myself, of giving myself the space to process the loss and to try to figure out who I was on the other side of it um, when I didn't know what it was supposed to look like or what the healing process you know, was supposed to be or how long is this going to take, mm -hmm. um, but just to give myself grace. And I think that's something that's certainly true for someone in any situation of loss you know, you want to know the time frame. You want to know when it's going to feel better. And it's really just not definable. But most of the time, you have to be willing to give yourself the grace for the process. And how do you, your husband at the time then, mm -hmm. how was that, um, how did this affect your relationship? How do you feel like you journeyed yeah. through that with him at the time? So looking back on it, I was certainly more vocal than he was, uh, which I think is typical. You know, women are tend to be talkers <laughs> yeah. and we're more emotional and more yeah. expressive. Um, and he really didn't say much about how he felt at all. But I know that he carried the pain that I felt in a way that he wanted to fix it, you know, wanted to make it better. And there really wasn't any fixing it or making it better. Um, and certainly as the years progressed, I could see that there would be places and times where I knew he was still bothered by the loss of our first daughter. Mm -hmm. And I would say, don't you want to talk to somebody about this? And he would say, you know, guys don't talk about their feelings. Nobody talks about their feelings with me. Um, which can be somewhat true, you know, again, stereotypically, but it's this place of really knowing that everybody has to talk about it. You have to talk yeah. about your pain, whether you're talking to a friend or a counselor or someone, it's just important to know that you're not the only one that's carrying it. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then what's the next stop so, on your journey? <laughs> so for me, it went a couple years before I did get pregnant again. And in that span of time, God really did give me the healing that I needed to be okay with life as it was, to find joy in moments that I wouldn't have ordinarily seen as being joyful, mm -hmm. to be okay not knowing what was coming next and knowing that it really wasn't in my control. So it was a season of great growth which I think is also something that we typically find when life is hard. It has the opportunity to be a catalyst for growth in a place that maybe we wouldn't have wanted it, but still can be so beautiful if we'll allow it to be. Um, and then I did get pregnant uh, and had an ectopic pregnancy, but I had come to this peace and belief that God was going to give us a child. So even though I was moving through that second loss, I knew for me that it wasn't going to be the end. Uh, but at the same time, I was really done with talking about the whole concept of pregnancy. I was like, forget it. Yeah. So before <laughs> no you more. had your daughter, you had a daughter first? I had a daughter first. So before yeah. you had your daughter, you actually had a second loss. I did. Okay. Yes. Yeah. An ectopic pregnancy. And then I was like, okay, I'm done. I don't want to talk about this pregnancy <laughs> thing. I'm not trying to get pregnant anymore. I'm just Absolutely. done for a while. Yeah. And of course, that's when I got pregnant. Because <laughs> isn't that the way it always goes? Mm -hmm. And I knew this was different and I knew that this was going to be my daughter uh, so people would say like oh did you have an ultrasound and I would say well not yet but I know I'm having a girl and her name's going to be Abigail and it That's was crazy. and she was born on her due date appreciate the babies that come on time yeah. <laughs> yeah. yes, yes. What shout out mean? Bethany yeah. one of our previous <laughs> guests who just had a baby 12 days late Second oh. baby, 12 days late. Yeah, my yep. second so. a son who was late, and he's always been late since. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes, so coming on time is probably very nice. It hasn't yes. happened for me, but... Yeah. <laughs> what a gift, though, that assurance yes. that you felt and that confidence. Yeah. Um, definitely God working in that to let you Absolutely. know. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah, so then after Abigail was born... A couple years later, we had Bryce, and a few years after that, we had Carson. And, you know, I knew that I was living my dream, although being a mom was certainly much more challenging than I had ever envisioned and not quite like I thought it was going to look. Yeah. Uh, sleepless nights and ear infections and throwing up and right. all that really great stuff of motherhood. Mm -hmm. But I knew that God had given me the desires of my heart and had come to this place where I was really settled and just grateful for that. Yeah. So that's kind of the point where we were on October 2nd, 2006. So Abigail was in second grade, Bryce was in kindergarten, and Carson was a year and a half. And it was a beautiful day. You know, it was one of those days where you, life just looks good. You know, I was a stay-at-home mom and wife and doing what I love to do. Abigail and Bryce got on the bus that morning. Charlie had walked with us to the bus and said, you know, I love you and kissed the kids before he, he they left. And we walked home and 
you'd never think that that would be the last time that they would see their dad. But So nothing seemed unusual? No, it just didn't seem out of the ordinary at all. He had some things to do for work. And I was going to lead a prayer group and taking Carson with me. And I said, see you around lunchtime. When I came home from the prayer group, he wasn't there, which was a little bit unusual. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't long until he called me and said, Marie, I'm not coming home. And I could tell by the sound of his voice that he meant it. It was cold and lifeless in a way that I had never heard before. But at the same time, you know, it's one of those experiences where you're thinking this can't possibly be happening. And I don't understand what's going on. Was that all he said? Was that... Well, I started saying to him, like, please, whatever it is that you have planned, don't do it. You know, there has to be another way. There's always another way. And the things that he was saying weren't making sense to me. I was becoming increasingly concerned that he had planned to harm himself, but not thinking in any way that yeah, it involved anyone else. Yeah, I was just trying to see, like, yeah. you just assumed he was by himself. And it sounded I did. like when yes. he says that, obviously... You're thinking suicide, but... Right. And it was completely silent in the background. There was no, you know, no other sound when he was talking to me. Um, But finally, at the end of the call, he said, I love you. Tell our family that I love them. And I left a note for you on the dresser. So we hung up the phone and I went to read the note. And I thought, you know, I've never seen a suicide note before, but this must be one. And I thought maybe if I call 911, something that seems insignificant to me would make sense to them and they could help stop whatever it is that's going to happen. Yeah. So I called 911 and immediately could tell by the dispatcher's voice when I told him about Charlie's call and told him about the letter that he knew about the situation. He knew far more than I did. The dispatcher was, did. Yeah, and he was not telling me anything. Oh, man. Oh, that, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I said to him, oh. you know, what should I do? And he said, just stay at home. If we need you, we'll give you a call back. And I hung up the phone. And by that time, I could hear the sound of the police cars racing up the street and the helicopters flying overhead. And it's the kind of thing that you want to say, there is no possible way that this all goes together. But I knew in the pit of my stomach that it had to all be one. And not what you expect when you're calling for help and you got this distress call and for them just to say... Stay, yeah. stay there. We've got yeah. for some just for some background for people oh. that might be local. You were living in like Christiana area. George, well, it was Georgetown? Georgetown, which is this very strange blending point of like Christiana, Bart, Coryville, and Paradise. It okay. all comes together in this little point that's Georgetown. So. Okay. So yeah, yeah country, beautiful, very rural community, Amish oh, community. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So this is this is where you're at. Yes. Just to give people context, right. it's like a beautiful day, and you you lived in the Amish area, so it's right. not like okay. Yeah, we could hear the sound of harvesting that was happening that day. Yeah. You know, I had more Amish neighbors than not. Mm-hmm. It was a very rural community. You know, we weren't strangers to one another. We bought produce at their roadside stands and flowers from their greenhouses and said hello as we walked down the street and. Yeah. You know, it was a community of people who cared about each other. So right. um, for all of this to be happening, it was just mind-blowing. Right. You right. Know? So you're in your yeah. house and you hear all these I'm, yeah. alarms and mm-hmm. cars. And yes. What did you do? And I just waited. Um, it wasn't long until the police were pulling in my driveway. You know, it felt like the blink of an eye, really, from the time of that phone call until they were there. And I met them at the door, and I said, it's Charlie, isn't it? And they said, yes. And I said, and he's dead, isn't he? And they said, yes. And they came in and asked me questions and told me things that nobody would want to hear about someone that they loved. And to think that Charlie could have somehow been capable of the things that he had done, you know, when I knew how much he loved his own kids. Mm -hmm. It was just something that you'd want to run away from, that you would want to deny that there was any way that this could be possible. But it was one of those places where you can't deny it because it's staring you right in the face. Um, And so, you know, we talked talked to the detectives for a while and they were so kind, you know, and they did their investigation. And as they were getting ready to leave, one of them stayed behind. You know, they said, you probably ought to collect whatever belongings you think you might need for a week and plan to leave your home especially knowing the invasion of the media was coming and they said, we'll leave one detective back with you just to kind of protect you. If anybody comes to your door um, while while you're getting ready to leave. And, and so it's this, my kids were at school. The youngest was taking a nap. Yeah. Yeah. So it's this amazing place of thinking, how can this possibly be of, okay, now I have to prepare to leave my house for a week while I'm trying to digest all of this information. And I'm feeling so shocked 
and overwhelmed, but there's no time to stop and process any of that because yeah. I need to keep moving. I just keep, keep feeling like the word that's coming to my mind is like frantic. I would feel like yeah. frantic, like what on earth wow. do I do? Like what is going on? Like your whole life changed in a moment and yes. you need to still keep going. Yeah, like you said, exactly. Taking steps forward, but yeah. And wow. you have a little one that still, you know. I mean, all of them need you, but you yeah. have one that's literally napping and Yes. Wow, so I just do. started packing things up and thinking, well, we'll go to my parents' house. It's down the street and around the corner and not far enough by any means, but at least it's not my house. Mm-hmm. And as I was doing that and carrying things out to the door and kind of stacking them up there, I just felt like the Lord was asking me to make a decision about what I would believe my life to be. And I knew that I only had two choices. I could believe that our lives were over and we were going down like the fastest sinking ship, or I could believe that somehow... This God that I had read about in the pages of the word and I'd heard people testify of him to be this God who had spoken to me and carried me through my own places of loss, that he would somehow come to rescue us. And it's really not that I was this giant of faith that day. It's just Mm -hmm. that I knew I was desperate. I knew that I had nothing and I knew I had nothing to lose by trusting him. So I simply made a choice to believe that what the enemy meant for evil, that God would indeed use for good that I didn't have any capacity to know what that would look like. And certainly not just for my family, but for the Amish community, for the first responders, for everyone that was impacted by this. Mm -hmm. I just said, God, whatever you can do, do it. In the midst of all of that, you felt like God was calling you to that decision. Yeah, I will never forget where I was standing in my living room. I was just kind of looking up at the ceiling fan, you know, just visually thinking, okay, I have to make this choice. I will always remember that moment. And I think, you know, that the other side of that was immediately I felt God giving me so much peace, Mm -hmm. so much strength and so much grace that I wouldn't have ever anticipated. I mean, I was a shy girl. I never wanted to be the center of attention. I was always concerned about what other people thought of me. And suddenly... I just had this strength and peace that I had never had before in my life. So if you would have said to me the day before that, if you would have said on October 1st, hey, Marie, you're going to go through some very traumatic events, you know, your entire life is going to change in a matter of minutes, I would have said, absolutely not. There's no way I can survive that. Pick someone else, (laughs) you know? But on the same hand, if you would have said, Marie, you're going to go through some very difficult days, you know, some some life-shaking tragedy. But on the other side of this, you're going to see the way that God gives you strength, that he gives you courage, and the way that he brings redemption into your life. Mm -hmm. I would have looked at those circumstances and thought, not possible, you know, but he has. Wow. Yeah. So you make that choice and you know Mm -hmm. that... Like you said, God will redeem that and what the enemy means for evil, he will turn to good. And Mm -hmm. you make that decision in the midst of packing. Yes. And then you leave. And then I left. I went to my parents' home. My mom had gotten my kids from school. I had called her and told her what was going on. She picked them up at school, which was amazing. It was right before the school went on lockdown mode and they wouldn't have been released. So my kids are playing in the backyard with my parents and they're laughing. You know, they have no idea what just happened in their world. And I'm sitting in their living room thinking, I cannot believe that I have to tell them that they no longer have a father and about the way he chose to leave. Because it wasn't just that they lost their dad. Mm -hmm. It was the way they lost him. And I was sitting there and I was saying, God, you know what? You've got to fix this because I can't. I cannot fix this. But this was not supposed to be their reality. Right. This wasn't supposed to be their story. And you have to fix this. And I just felt like he was saying to me, you know what, Marie? I'm not going to fix it, but I am going to redeem it. Mm -hmm. And in that moment, he took such weight off my shoulders of feeling like every word, every choice, everything that I would ever do mattered. Because until that moment, I was thinking, I don't know how I'm ever going to overcome this. I don't know how as a single parent, I'm going to be able to get to this place where I can overcome their loss. I mean, I love my kids and there isn't anything I wouldn't do for them. But thinking in one moment, I'm going to have to shatter their world. And then how will I help put those pieces back together? It just seemed like too much for me. But in that place of feeling the Lord promised me that he was going to redeem it, I knew that, yes, I would always want to be the very best mom I could be. But it didn't mean that I had to be perfect. Right. I just had to do what I could do on any given day because every day who we are looks a little different. And I'm sure that has followed you. It has. 
since then. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, I can't wait to hear, you know, just how you picked up those pieces then. Yeah. And I... This is like about the point I'm at in your book. Okay. So I feel like I've been Spoiler having alert. a surreal experience yes. that yes. like I have read this and yeah. even though I remember hearing about what happened on the news, it was an it was national news. It was Absolutely. everywhere. Yeah. Um mm-hmm. as I've been reading it, it still just feels like this like far away thing. Sure. And speaking to you is just amazing to hear you know, this was real life for somebody. This Mm -hmm. isn't just a story. And I feel like as a mom, you know, I can just imagine like what had to be going through your head. Like this actually happened. I have had like, (laughs) my husband and I have a great marriage, but we have had fights in our first years of being married where I remember thinking like, maybe I should just, you know, maybe I should just pack up and go. Have you ever had one of those fights? Like (laughs) in like seconds, in 30 seconds, you can be thinking about like, what life would be like if it was completely different Mm -hmm. or, you know, you just hear about something else on the news and think about like, well, if that happened to my family, like I remember that, um, that duck boat in like Chicago or wherever that was Mm -hmm. out on that lake. Yes. Wasn't that like about a year ago? There was that freak storm that came up and that Mm -hmm. whole boat sank and some people literally lost their whole families. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I just remember in those, you know, you watch it and literally your brain in 30, 40 seconds can be like, what would happen if that was yes. me? And then yes. two minutes later, you're like eating your pasta again and it's, you know, yeah. but when you're living that, I just can't even imagine um, what your thoughts must have been. So we're going to take a quick break and then we will be right back. Got to get the babies comfortable again. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll be right back in a few minutes. If you're one of our local listeners, we invite you to join us next month at Bell & Berry Summer Home & Style Market. It's happening Friday, July 19th from 6 to 8 p.m. and Saturday, July 20th from 9 to 3 at the Lampeter Cafe. The market is organized by our very own Chris Teen and her event planning business, so I know it's going to include an awesome lineup of vendors. With the home and style theme, some of the items you'll find at the summer market include boutique clothing and accessories, jewelry, makeup and skincare products, along with fresh cut flowers from a local florist so you can grab some to treat yourself or pick up a small bouquet for your mom. Grab lunch or dinner at the cafe and browse through the amazing products and services the vendors will have showcased in the livery. It's sure to be a fun few days of shopping. We will be there, probably spending too much money, and we can't wait to see you too. We look forward to July 19th and 20th at the Lampeter Cafe, Bell and Berry's Home and Style Market. Welcome back. We are chatting with Marie. Um, she's been sharing her story with us, and we're on the edge of our yeah. seats. <laughs> if you have been following along, you probably feel the same way. Yeah. Um, Marie, we were just talking about that morning when you received the news. Um, how did you handle things once you were at your parents? You mentioned your mom had picked up your kids from school. It really mm-hmm. does take a village, mm-hmm. especially when it things does. like this happen. It does. Yeah. So, you know, I, I called them in and I just said to them, today your dad made some very bad choices and some people got hurt and some people died and he died too. And I knew that I didn't need to tell them everything in one moment, but that was plenty for them to digest and that I could have conversations with them in the days afterwards. And certainly a seven-year-old girl is going to understand things at a different level than a five-year-old boy. Um, but I knew that I wasn't responsible to make it all go away or to make it all feel better. Um, And I think certainly the thing with grief is that you have to be willing to process it. Um, You can't just push it away and deny that it exists. And I wanted to be present for them, you know, allowing God to heal me and help me walk through my own path Mm -hmm. so that I could then in turn help my kids do the same thing. Do you remember in that moment how your children responded to that news? They were just quiet and, and you know, a little bit crying. And then, and I'm thinking to myself, how do we get out of this? You know, mm-hmm. like I, I knew how we were going to move into it, but I had no idea how to get out of that moment. And then, you know, just in the beauty of God and in children, my 18 month old looked at his brother and said, do you want to play? And it was kind of like, you know, the icebreaker that we needed to be able to mm-hmm. somehow move from that space. Um, and I think, you know, that really is the thing. All kids just want to be normal. They mm-hmm. just want life to be normal. And so there were a lot of parts of our life that weren't normal. Mm-hmm. But 
in as many places as we could, I tried to keep it as normal as possible. Um, you know, we spent a week out of our home and after we came back, it was me and the three kids and I made dinners just like I usually did. And I put them to bed like I did and, you know, took them to school or whatever. It wasn't that I didn't want anyone's help, but I wanted them to know that life was okay and that we were going to be okay. And that some parts of life were still normal. You were there constant. Exactly. So you were continuing. Yes. And what did yeah. you do in those days and weeks for yourself or to care for yourself and your own healing in the midst of that? Yeah. I really put a priority on the time that I spent with God. Um, I mean, I knew that there were probably a lot of self-help books as far as <laughs> you know, how to move through things like this, but I did not have time to even look for them. Like my anger is in the word. <laughs> yes. And yeah. So I would just, you know, concentrate on a passage of scripture or maybe just one verse. Mm -hmm. And I also made some time to exercise. You know, I had like an elliptical and mm -hmm. I wrote it in the living room while my kids were watching TV at <laughs> night. Um, but just that positive way to get some exercise and have all of that you know, the release of endorphins and, you know, the stress and all of that yeah. kind of stuff. It's so important to take care of ourselves when we're in difficult situations and make that priority to nurture ourselves both, you know, physically and mentally and emotionally, mm -hmm. um, spiritually, so that you can come through it in a whole way. Um, and I just was asking the Lord, you know, I was saying, okay, God, I don't want to miss an opportunity to connect my kids to you, but I don't really know how I'm supposed to look at life now because all I was seeing were these devastating circumstances. Mm -hmm. And I felt like he was reminding me of a scavenger hunt that I had gone on as a child. And just that anticip anticipation when you are getting a clue and knowing that sometime you're going to find a prize. And I felt like he was saying, Marie, that's how I want you to approach your life. As if you're on this incredible scavenger hunt with me. And when you least expect it, there I'll be giving you some kind of clue as to my love for you or surprising you with some kind of prize. And that's really been the thing that I've tried to keep in mind, you know, beyond this last decade of life since then, that life really is about perspective. And I'm going to find whatever it is that I'm looking for. And I think if I would have made the choice that day to think that my life was over, it wouldn't have changed anything that God did in my life. It would have changed the way I would have been able to see it. And that would have ultimately changed whether I could receive it or not. You know, God is good and he loves us and he's going to pour out his love on us all the time. It's just up to us to receive that. So, you know, for me going forward from that day, it was really an opportunity to say, okay, I want to look for where God's at and I want to look for the way that he's meeting us and what he's doing in our lives that's not just about how devastating all of this is but that's about the goodness and the wholeness of who he is and who he's creating us right. to be even in these circumstances like you said that your, your perspective was that it wasn't going to change yes. nothing that we do is going to change who God is right yeah but I, I just never thought of a moment of grief that way. What are you going to fix your eyes on? What are you going to search for? And mm -hmm. when you're searching for the goodness of God, you're going to find it. Find it. Yeah. Yes, yeah. absolutely. I feel like yeah. on like a more tangible level when it comes to grief, I just think back to um, when my grandfather passed away. It was terribly sad. Obviously mm -hmm. a completely different type of situation. But it was one of those things I can still remember how sad we were on that day that like we found out and then sure. the day of the funeral and my mom has this huge, huge family. I think at Thanksgiving this year, we had like 74 people, not Amish in any way. <laughs> so in Lancaster, sometimes people are surprised to hear sure. that. They're like, yeah. oh, it must've been Amish. Yes. Like, we yeah. were, we were just yeah. a big family, but, um, I remember, regardless of how sad all of us were, and like, you know, it is a time of grief, like, especially the younger cousins that like had no clue what was going on and like the little mm -hmm. ones. It was just this day that like brought everybody together. And like, how often does that actually happen with that yes. many people? And I feel like I have pictures that we took of the little kids just happy and playing and like, for them, it was just this wonderful day to get together with their, with their cousins and, and their friends. And... You know, you can wallow in it or you can look at, you know, look at the legacy this person's left, look at this, you know, this opportunity that we have now because of this terrible thing that happened. Mm -hmm. But yeah, even just in that 
in that way, I'm sure it brought your family closer from mm. what I have read. Yes. They were definitely there and yeah. they didn't live far either. No. So yes. that is always yes. nice. I don't think you're the only one in Lancaster that only lives a few houses down yes. from your parents. <laughs> yes, exactly. And I think for me, it really made me look at my life differently. I think tragedy, you know, it mm-hmm. often does that. It makes you look at your life differently. It made me think about all the places where I had wasted time or had wasted Mm -hmm. opportunity or had doubted myself. Mm -hmm. Um, And I really wanted to change that. And I wanted to know who God had created me to be. I felt his strength and his presence and his peace in such amazing ways, you know, in the days and weeks and months after all that happened. And I I wanted to live like that all the time. I Mm -hmm. wanted to see those places where he was meeting me or encouraging me to think about things in a different way, encouraging me to see myself in a different way. And I thought about all the times that I had kind of discounted myself or doubted myself. And I mean, I totally am a different person today than I was pre, you know, October 2nd, 2006. And and I really think for the better, you know, that that I see myself as more capable or I identify my dreams and goals and go after them. Mm -hmm. Um, because life is too short to waste wishing that it could be different, yeah. you know? And, and for me, this was the opportunity to have it be different. Yeah. So I did want to ask <laughs> before we dive too much into just where you are now. Yeah. Um, well, I'm sure this is part of that. How, how did you get through? Obviously you're grieving. This is a loss. Like, mm-hmm. like you've explained, like this was completely unexpected. You had no Absolutely. clue your husband was capable of things like this, but I'm sure not only were you upset, obviously, because you were very much in love, but mm-hmm. how did you deal with the the actions he had taken? Did you, were you angry? You know, it's not like when an older person mm-hmm. dies and, oh, they sure. live this great life and, you know, it's easier yeah. to accept maybe. Well, there's a whole lot more you were having yeah, to work like, through than other losses. Yeah, I guess yeah. I'm just wondering, like, how did you process that? Like, how did you handle the anger or was there guilt, like, feeling like, I don't know, you're tied to this person that did these terrible things. So I think, uh, you know, for me, for my parents, for Charlie's parents, we talked about it a lot afterwards. Like, how did we not see this? How did we miss it? We were all together the weekend before this happened. How didn't anyone see anything? Mm -hmm. Um, But there just weren't any signs. So I think, you know, we did work through that whole place of feeling guilty Mm -hmm. um, or guilt by association. You know, yeah. uh, which I think is something that a lot of people can feel when a family member does something that's wrong. Um, but beyond that, for me, as I read Charlie's letter, I could see clearly that the loss of our first daughter had led to this place of great anger and bitterness that he held towards God. Um, that he had never recovered from that loss, but that he had kept it really hidden away in his heart. And I thought, you know what, if this is what anger and bitterness is capable of, then I don't want them. And so while I would... You know, while I would want to feel just angry about what he had done, I knew that that wasn't the answer. And the answer was allowing God to help me forgive him. Um, So it wasn't like it was this one-time experience. And I think for me, it was this place of great sorrow. You know, sorrow for the pain that he caused the Amish family. Sorrow for what the first responders experienced that day and the trauma that it led to in the aftermath of their lives. Sorrow for the loss that my kids faced and that my family faced. Sorrow for me and the brokenness of the dreams that I experienced. Um, So it was just, I would say more than anything, it was a place of profound sorrow. But we read in the word that Jesus invited us into this place of sharing his sufferings so that we can also share in his strength. Um, and as I allowed the Lord to come into this place of my sorrow, I found him transforming me, helping me to release that and to allow him to then fill me with his peace and his faith and his love and his healing. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. And through the midst of all this, I mean, you've shared some of your the way you coped with it, mm-hmm. but what other, do you have like some touch points that you would share with any other moms or women, sure. uh, listeners going through grief? What some of those? So I end up, for I you? feel like I end up mentoring a lot of women who are going through a grief place because it can be a hard thing to talk about when someone, you know, with a family member who maybe hasn't experienced it. So I feel like I have a lot of these conversations and probably my number one thing that I say is give yourself grace. The way you're feeling is normal. It's really easy to feel like you must be going crazy or there's totally something wrong with you. But a lot of times the feelings that we have are normal Mm -hmm. um, from the brokenness that we've experienced. So I think, you know, just giving grace 
and knowing that it is a process and allowing the process to look like whatever it does. You know that it's not a one size fits all. Certainly you can read someone else's book or perspective on what their healing journey looked like, but that was their healing. You know, your healing, my healing, it's going to be different. And it's um, really about saying, okay, whatever this healing journey looks like, I'm going to be okay with it. I'm not going to get frustrated with myself because I want to be further than I am, Mm -hmm. Um, but I'm going to allow the process to look like whatever it does. And then certainly surrounding yourself with people who love you and care about you that you can be real with in an authentic way. So that not, no one's feeling on top of their grief that they're doing something wrong or that they're, you know, I'm not following the right path because there is none. Right. That must be so freeing for people to hear. It's like you're giving them permission just to be wherever they are. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. What would you say, do you have any, um, like Christine was saying, just any tips or just like a, there is no how to, sure. but for a mom that might have kids, um, is there anything you learned from even just the way you sat your kids down? Yeah. Anything you would have changed or anything yeah. that you're like, you know what, that was the one thing that I think that was great. Or as you worked through things, you know, now that they're older, was there was there a certain point you could tell us that, you know, you sat down and told them more about what happened? Mm-hmm. I'm assuming now they were probably old enough they might have asked more about their dad. Um, what does that look like? So I did tell them everything that had happened for my ones that were in school. I knew, knew they needed to know everything before they went back to school because I didn't want to risk them hearing something on the playground that they would think, mm. there's no way that that could be what my dad did. Um, so I did tell them the truth in its entirety. And I think, you know, as a parent, we think about all these conversations that we're going to have to have with our kids as they're growing up <laughs> and things that might be uncomfortable yeah. and whatever. But I think it's really important to be honest with our kids Um, to be truthful with them, to be direct. Mm -hmm. Because if we want them to be honest and truthful and direct with us, we have to model that for them. So I think think the starting point to any difficult situation is just telling yourself, you know what, I'm going to be honest about this. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be truthful about this. And we're all going to (laughs) live, you know, this this conversation is not going to kill us. We're going to live through it. And we're going to be better because of it. I think it's just not being afraid of those difficult conversations. Mm -hmm. Um, And for us, you know, we've had a lot of conversations in the years since. I don't want this to be something that my kids, you know, we only talked about when it happened. Mm -hmm. And then as they grew, they could like lock it off in some remote place and think that it really didn't exist. Right. Because then they'd have to go through it, you know, as a teenager or an adult in a way that maybe would be more traumatic. Um, So we do talk about it from time to time, you know, just to remember the things that happened, but not in a place of just identifying the devastation, but then also identifying the redemption, the beauty, you know, the things that they can say that are good beyond that. And I don't just talk about Charlie from a negative perspective. I also talk about his favorite foods and things, you know, that he enjoyed doing because I don't ever want my kids to think that they have to be ashamed if there's something similar to them. Like, Oh, Hey, I love banana cream pie. My dad loved banana cream pie. I don't want them to feel bad about that. I want them to be able to see him as a real person outside of this, because I don't think any one of us would want to be remembered simply for our very worst day. I never would have thought of that. Wow. And I think it's really impactful when you said you want to have those hard conversations to model that for your children Mm -hmm. and to be the one to bring them that truth first. And that goes for huge things like that conversation, but I'm sure other conversations you've had since then as they grew up and became teenagers. Um, And also how you can present that to them, but know that you're not responsible. You shared that for how they feel or maybe what they're going through. You're trusting the Lord to work in their lives as you're being obedient to what you feel like you need to do as their mom. Absolutely. And I think, you know, that perspective of redemption is important because as parents, we want to think that whatever it is that we tell our kids, they're going to listen to us <laughs> and they're going to do it exactly like we said, and they're Wait, never going to have a problem. That that's not However, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm going to suggest (laughs) that most of the time they make their own choices. And, you know, sometimes our kids are walking out difficult stories that maybe weren't what we had wanted Mm -hmm. for them. But it doesn't mean that God can't do something incredibly beautiful, even in the midst of something we wouldn't have picked. Like you said, you just keep looking for it and waiting expectantly. Absolutely. you know he's going to do it. I like that. I just like that perspective. And I feel like that's something I'm going to, like, tuck away. 
so that if I need that at some point, I just, I really like thinking of things like that. Yes. Well, I know, I'm maybe I will read your book a little sooner than a month, because I want to hear the ins and outs yes. of everything, yeah. but I love how this journey that you've been on in your life, this this whole story is even touching me and for different reasons and just mm-hmm. your experience as a mom and having hard conversations. Oh. I saw a meme on Facebook recently that said in this family, we do hard things. Mm-hmm. And that is so encouraging to me not to be afraid of those conversations or the times mm-hmm. that will come because the God we serve is greater than all those things. Absolutely. Amen. Your story so transcends <laughs> all of that. Yeah. So how did you become a mom of six? Yes. So short <laughs> and quicker version. There's all kinds of funny stories to go along with that. But um, I married my husband, Dan, about eight months, I guess, after all of this had happened. I never would have thought that I would get married so quickly. And I, if I had heard anyone else living this story, I probably would have said they were doing it wrong. But God has a funny way of having <laughs> us do things that we think are crazy. Um, and I cannot imagine life without Dan. He's phenomenal. Just an incredible support to me and the way that he loves our kids is amazing. Uh, so when we got married, we had five kids ranging in age from 2 to 16. So we were doing potty training and driver training and everything in between all at the very same time. Why not? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes. And then a few years ago, we adopted our son from South Africa. He'll be home with us for years this summer. Um, And for me, I think I had always had adoption on my heart ever since I was a little girl. But then certainly, you know, seeing my kids lose their dad, it made me think about loss a little bit more precisely and what that looks like for kids around the world. Um, So, you know, we had this incredible adoption journey just one year start to finish till we brought our son home. And I cannot imagine life without Mm -hmm. him. You know, life was busy and crazy and chaotic and wonderful and all of, you know, anything before we adopted him. And certainly you wouldn't think in those moments that it could even be better or more. But I can't imagine life without him. You know, just the way that I think... Each one of us is probably a better version of ourselves because of him. Um, He has a smile that just lights up your life. And he's funny and tells it like it is. And (laughs) isn't afraid to say what he's thinking, you know. Um, All of these things that I wouldn't change for a minute about him. Somebody was asking my mom after we came home, you know, to describe him. And she said, well, you know Marie's other children, right? And and they said yes. And she said, well, he's just the complete opposite. (laughs) Like where my kids are more reserved and quiet and, you know, and shy and all that kind of stuff. He's a little bit more the other way. So, um, yeah, it's it's just been a really beautiful story. And I think, you know, I think about myself back when I was that girl who lost her first child laying in the hospital thinking, am I ever going to have kids of my own to come to this place now where we have six kids and um, you know the journey of redemption to get there and I think for me that's really what gives me the passion to share whether it's through my book or through speaking um, or just through one-on-one conversations you know with people around the world is just that we all go through difficult circumstances we all go through pain and loss mm-hmm. and it's profound you know it changes us And in those moments, it's hard to believe that life is going to get better or that it's going to feel different than that. But while we all know pain and loss, we all have the opportunity to also know redemption and restoration. So for me, it's this passion to say, okay, if God could take the broken pieces of my life that I wouldn't have ever thought were capable of being put back together like this, then what can he do in your life? (laughs) Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's awesome. I love too that you just shared a couple times like everyone's grief looks different. And yes. like you said, it was eight months after this happened and you you were getting married again. Yes. I feel like that's an area that people are quick to pass judgment when they're not the one in that circumstance. And we just had a guest on the show, um, Megan Dunn. She talked a little bit about her battle of postpartum and how that had led to a crumbled marriage. And she's in a different relationship now and she's getting married and it's only been in her case it's been a couple of years but Mm -hmm. there are people that would be like oh that's so soon Mm -hmm. and you know what it's not your journey and every situation is different different. everyone processes things differently for some people it takes more time less time maybe you just need time to yourself (laughs) um and I feel like that's really empowering and I'm just I don't know as a as a mom and as someone that's on social media a lot I just really I feel like women need to be supporting other women mm-hmm. instead of judging or, you know, you don't, you don't know. Right. I always think to like, just when you see people in public or a difficult kid or something like 
you don't know, maybe they have a special need or maybe that mm-hmm. mom is having like an awful day. And I heard a speaker once say something about, you know, when you see a mom, you know, struggling with her kids at the store, you know, <laughs> if you have a second, yes. help her or just be the person to say <laughs> yeah. like, you know what? You're doing okay. great. Yes. Cause yeah. I've been that person. I've had to, you know, scold my kids and it's, it's embarrassing and you feel like all eyes are on you yes. and to just hear another mom be like, you did the right thing. Like, <laughs> I remember taking my one son to Costco and he would literally like hide underneath those big displays where all the clothes are mm. and cry. And I remember standing there thinking, <laughs> I can't get him out of there. And everybody's looking at you. Oh my. Yes, those are the fun days. But sometimes but I just it laugh. Does change. So like, yes. <laughs> you know, I, I saved a picture and I do show it to him from time to time. Perfect. Oh, oh that's goodness. awesome. Yeah. And we laugh about it now. And, you know, in the moment you think. I'm never going to get beyond this, but you yeah. do. Yep. Yeah, you do. Yes. So you obviously have a book um, yes. that shares more about your journey. Mm-hmm. Um, can you share a little bit about that and where people can find it if they're sure. interested to learn more? So the book's called One Light Still Shines, and they can find that on Amazon and CBD. You can also pop over to my website, which is real easy. It's just mariemonville.com and check it out there. Awesome. And we will yeah. definitely share more about that in our show yeah. notes. I'm sure people yeah. will. Yeah want to hear more from you I know I do yeah and it's not just good because like we know Marie like I have been reading this book and like I don't do a ton of reading anymore so it's hard for me to like really stay in the book and I was just telling before we got started that this weekend like three times I sat down to read it and I just like I was like really at a not great stopping point and I needed to see what was happening next yes. and my kids I could just not find time to read it was so aggravating so, yeah. I've had so many people say, I stayed up all night because I had to finish your book. And my husband asked me, what was the matter with me? Because I used an entire box of tissues. And I told him <laughs> to let me alone. Just yeah. let me be. <laughs> yep. It's one of yes. those. So it is, there are a lot of sad moments, but there are some really happy places yeah. as well. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I just love how you've shared about your faith and through the book too. It's it's just really cool how you share how that was with you every step of the way. Mm-hmm. It's not like she shares like what happened and then it's like, oh, and by the way, like... I just love that in every minute of it, you're like, you know, just, I was speaking to the Lord out loud. I was praying over my house. I didn't even know what was happening, but I think at one point you just said that you didn't even know what was coming out of your mouth and you felt like it was not from you. It was just, and I just love how real it is. Um, Thanks. So thanks for sharing that. And on a lighter note, we wanted to talk about favorite things. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. Before we finish up, let's leave it with that. (laughs) So I would have to say my current favorite thing is my ice shaker water bottle, which apparently was on Shark Tank. I wouldn't know. I'm not usually that in the know, but my daughter told me that it was. uh, I need to look this up because I'm a huge Shark Tank fan. So when you said that my eyes lit up. So I love that it keeps water cold. And who drinks enough water? I mean, I said earlier, (laughs) I drink way more than my fair share of coffee, but water can sometimes be a struggle. But I'm way more apt to drink an adequate amount of water if I'm just grabbing a water bottle with a straw. It's so much easier just to suck it down with a straw than actually like put a glass to your mouth. Um, So my favorite thing is my water bottle. I'm going to be giving one of these away uh, through my Instagram page. So pop over to, to Marie Monville on Instagram if you want to check that out. Yes, please. Ooh, I'm yes. If I don't win, I'm going to buy it because I love that pattern <laughs> yes. as well. It's cute, isn't it? So Navy and floral sweet. and all that yeah. fun stuff. Yeah. Oh, I love it. Awesome. Yeah. What's your favorite thing? Favorite thing. I do love, I don't know if I shared this, um, some blankets that I've been using for Dorothy that are a, um, I don't know what, not a muslin. What's the other material? Oh, man. Like a cotton. Oh, like there's that like cotton blend that's mm-hmm. super soft. Yes. Mm. So, um, there's like, they have a little stretch to it. Yeah. A little stretch. Cause my daughter loves to be swaddled like real tight. Mm-hmm. So I have one from Lulu company and there's a few other websites, copper pearl. I know they sell them on Amazon cause love Amazon. Yes. <laughs> um, but they're just really soft blankets that I never had with my first daughter. I used the Muslim kind, but I'm just really loving them. Cause I love, I can pull her so tight and she just looks like a little burrito. Mm-hmm. So favorite thing, making my child mm-hmm. look like Mexican food. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Rachel? <laughs> I just have to say this because you brought up Mexican food and you yes. know, wrapping up your child. Yeah. Well, we do the same thing. We swaddle Robbie at night, and um, his name is Robbie. And when we make him a burrito, we call him Rob Burrito. Yeah, absolutely. Because yeah. there's a place downtown called yes. Rob Burritos. How could you not? How could you not? 
Shout out. It's a little Mexican place downtown that serves the best burritos. They're huge. Yeah. They are really good. They're like Chipotle size. Yes. And so, yeah, every night we're like, oh, here's the raw burrito. I'll hold them. <laughs> you know, I'll hand them to Kyle to hold them before, you know, I get into bed or whatever. And yeah. So sweet. Um, my sweet. favorite thing is a corny one this week. Um, I mean, it's not corny, but... Christine's usually the one that shares more sentimental things, and I usually have, like, a product or something. <laughs> but this week, my favorite thing is that Robbie is finally smiling. And That's my cute. favorite. <laughs> it's so sweet. Yeah. It's, like, the best thing. That's awesome. He's so much more expressive than just, like, a week ago. And, yeah, I just, my favorite thing is, like, this stage. Like, this eight week. He's getting to be eight weeks old, and it's just a lot of fun. And they're not quite as fragile as, like, when they're just born. <laughs> I know. Once they get that nut control, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. He's still working on that. But. Marie was saying how her children look learning to drive in these new phases. And I'm yes. thinking like, oh, as soon as she can hold her own bottle, we'll be set. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, Marie, thank you so much for oh, joining thanks us. Thanks for having me. It was so great to chat with you guys. Yeah. Um, so be sure to follow Marie. It's just at Marie Monville on Instagram. And um, same with her website. Be sure to check out the show notes. And if you haven't left us a review yet and you've enjoyed listening to the show, be sure to do that. We love connecting with you guys. And it's also a great way to help our show reach more people. So share it with a friend, write us a review, and have a great week. Thank you for joining us. And moms, in case you didn't already get the idea from this episode, you are doing amazing. Thank you so much for listening today. You are a part of a growing community of moms, business owners, and women who are here to encourage and inspire. You can connect with Rachel at Rachel Klein Creative on Instagram or rachelkleincreative.com to keep up with Christine and her latest events. Follow her business journey on Instagram at Bellamberry Co. And if you want to be first to know about upcoming guests and giveaways, sign up for the Thrive Podcast email list today. Simply visit rachelkleincreative.com slash the Thrive Podcast or follow at the Thrive Podcast on Instagram. If you've enjoyed listening this week or you've already added our show to your favorites playlist, we'd love for you to write us a review on iTunes. Your support and positive feedback allows us to keep encouraging moms and business owners each week. 